in this church this morning. I'm Reverend Donnie Mitchum, and Reverend Jesse Smith and I welcome you to worship this morning. If you're worshiping with us here or online, if you're online, we hope that you go ahead and start posting your joys and concerns and greeting one another so your church can celebrate and pray with you. If you're worshiping with us here, there's a tear-off in your bulletin where you can write those things and place them in the offering plate when it comes around. A few announcements I have this morning. The nut ladies are at it again. So there will be nuts for sale um, after church if you're interested in purchasing those for your holiday baking. Um, also, there will be poinsettias for sale. Look for more information about that in the upcoming weeks. Also, I want to put on your calendar December 5th. December 5th, we will be celebrating Undy Sunday again. I've got to say it that way. And <laughs> Cartley, I love you. I'm not going to say what she's thinking. But don't come in just your underwear. But bring underwear, new underwear, underwear, socks, undershirts for our homeless neighbors. And we're going to collect those with all of our, cl our cluster churches. And I look forward to that day. Also, this Wednesday at 615, we'll be making sandwiches, 800 sandwiches for our homeless neighbors. You're invited to come, wear your mask, and bring uh, a friend with you. We'll make those sandwiches in the Family Life Center at 615. And lastly, um, 50 plus will be meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock at Sports Page. Um, you're welcome to join them for food and fellowship. And now, wherever you are, stand in worship. In the secret, in the quiet, in the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there, in the secret, in the quiet hour I wait, oh, I want to know you more. Sing, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you. I
seated. Um, I'm going to call your attention to these beautiful flowers, right? Um, they're celebrating in honor of um, Joel and Corinne's 40th, is that right, Corinne? 40th wedding anniversary. And so we, as we go to um, our prayer this morning for All Saints Day, what a gift that all of us here who love you and all the saints that have gone before celebrate your anniversary with you too. Let's pray. Living God, in whom there is no shadow or change, we thank you for the gift of life eternal and for all those who, having served you well, now rest from their labors. We thank you for all the saints remembered and forgotten, for those dear souls most precious to us. Today we give thanks for those who, during the last 12 months, have died and entered into glory. We bless you for their life and love and rejoice for them all is well and all manner of things will be well. God of Jesus and our God, mindful of all those souls who have gone on ahead of us, teach us and all of those here of every race and place to follow their example to the best of our ability, to feed the poor in body and spirit, to support and comfort the mourners and the repentant, to encourage the meek and stand for them in crisis, to affirm those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to cherish and learn from the merciful, to be humbled by and stand with the peacemakers. May we clearly recognize what it means to be called the children of God and to know we are to be your saints neither by our own inclination or in our own strength, but by the call and the healing witness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now if our kids can come forward for children's time. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to see you guys this morning. I want to show you a picture. Do you see this picture? You might just scoot up. Do you know who that is? This is me right here. That's me about when I was your age. I was maybe in the fourth or fifth grade. I was rocking that mushroom jumpsuit right? And this is my first friend I've ever had, Kelly. We were friends since kindergarten, so we have now been friends for 48 years. We've been friends. I'm still friends with her, but that's mean. So look at that picture. Now I'm going to tell you something. Does that surprise you that I was not an athlete? Look at that person. She, I was skinny and uncoordinated. And when we played kickball, I was always the last one picked. Have you ever had that feeling before? Not being picked or being the last one picked? It doesn't feel good, does it? It really 
doesn't. So today is a day called All Saints Day. And what's interesting about that is in the Bible, do you know, have you ever heard of a saint before? Like Saint Jesse Smith. Have we ever said that? No. I haven't. <laughs> but <laughs> a saint is a, lots of times, I bet we could say this. Saint Lydia Warner. We might say that, might we? Somebody who's sweet and kind. But in God's world, saints are people that try and live like Jesus and try to love God and love other people. And in the Bible, when they said the word saint, they never said just one. They said saint. All, all of us. So God on this day reminds us all. I love you all. I have claimed you all. You are all mine. And nobody doesn't get picked, and nobody gets picked last. That sounds like a pretty good kingdom to be in, doesn't it? Where we are all included. So today, on All Saints Day, I want you to remember that God picked you. God chose you. And God chose us. And in God's kingdom, we are all saints. And we're all loved. And that's what I want you to remember today. All of us. Those here and those who are now living in heaven. We are all saints together in this place. God, thank you, thank you for your love that never picks any of us last, that chooses us all. And may we be people who remember to welcome others into a place where we are all welcome. Amen. All right, thank you, Miss Donnie. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. Uh, if you received one of these ministry menus and you filled it out, you could go ahead and drop this in the plate as it comes by. If you didn't receive one of these and you would like one, it's just a way for you to say how you will support uh, the ministry here at Christ UMC. You could pick one up in the back narthex and fill it out uh, and drop it in the plate after, after worship. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what we've been blessed with so that we might see your kingdom advance in our lifetime. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God from my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name and I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer child 
sing that I'm no longer I'm no longer child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What time is it? Oh, that we would learn and agree on what time it is. I left my house this morning with the microwave and the stove, both telling me I was about an hour late uh, for worship. But my watch and my phone and the clock in my car all said I was right on time. What time is it? Oh, that we would learn and agree on what time it is. I blame Benjamin Franklin for us not knowing what time it is this morning. It was Benjamin Franklin in an attempt to provide more daylight in the evening with less expense through artificial lighting that Benjamin Franklin wrote a journal article suggesting that we tinker with our clocks in the spring and in the fall. You know that Benjamin Franklin lived in the 18th century. And everybody thought Ben's idea was complete rubbish for 100 years. Until World War I, when we were trying to conserve energy. And we were trying to find a way to save on resources. What time is it? 
It's amazing to me how much difference an hour can make in my routine. This morning, I feel well-rested, ready to start my day. I didn't feel rushed or hurried along this morning. I feel clear-headed and engaged. Maybe I just needed an extra hour of sleep this entire time. What time is it? Is it time to do some Christmas shopping? Is it time to play some Christmas music? Is it time to start to fill our calendars with festive parties and get-togethers with old friends who are going to be in town? Is it time to watch Hallmark movies? Those cheesy, light-hearted romance movies that make us feel, ah, it's Christmas time. What time is it? Knowing what time it is is invaluable. For the comedian who's getting ready to deliver a punchline right after a pregnant pause that's got to wait just enough time for people to build anticipation and then to make them erupt with laughter. Knowing what time it is is important. Knowing what time it is is important for the farmer. Not just the date on the calendar, but they like to feel the pulse of the ground that they will till. They like to know exactly when to put the seed in the dirt and when to pull the crop from the dirt. It's about knowing what time it is. And I'm curious this morning if we know what time it is. In my experience, there's been a a myth that we like to believe in the church. And when we believe this myth in the church, it, it gets us off of our time. There's this myth that if I follow God, that if I fill out one of these ministry menus that the pastor sent to me and I say, yes, you can count on me to support Christ UMC through my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. If I fill this thing out and actually take it seriously, there's this myth that I believe that all will go well for me and my family. It's the myth of religious fulfillment. This myth that if I try to honor God, try to please God, that things will always go well for me. But the problem is, and for many of you I don't have to tell you this, Life does not always go the way that it intend, we intend it to go. Sometimes we have events, circumstances, things in our life that, that steal from us, that take from us, even when we don't deserve it. There are things and people that we lose along life's journey that cause us heartache and grief and pain. The myth that we believe is that God's Proverbs, the book of Proverbs in this book, are are promises. But they're not promises, they are Proverbs. And what's the difference between a proverb and a promise? A proverb is generally true. A promise is always true. When we read the Proverbs of Scripture, we we tend to think, we want to believe that if we do well, that God will make our life easier. It's almost like uh, yoga, right? That we, We go so that when we get older, we don't feel as immobile. Something, if we go to church, then we'll feel good later on in life, but that's not always the case. You see, Proverbs says, get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget and don't turn away from my words. Don't abandon her. (laughs) When the writer of Proverbs talks about wisdom, he uses the feminine. Don't abandon her. Wisdom is a she. And she will guard you. Love her, love wisdom, and she will protect you. That's a proverb. It's generally true that if you, 
If you listen to wisdom, if you seek out wisdom, if you want to know what is the wise thing to do in this situation, then generally wisdom will protect you. Wisdom will keep you from doing stupid things in your life. Can we all agree on that? It's generally true, but it's not always true. Another proverb that many have committed to memory is train a child in the way he or she should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And that is true, generally. But it is not always true. You can give a child a, an incredible home. You could teach that child love and how to forgive and how to serve. And, and you could be in church every single weekend. You could admit that you have flaws and, and ask for forgiveness from your, your kids. But sometimes you could train a child in the way that he or she should go and they, should, they can still depart from it. It's generally true, but it's not always true. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we all know the world that we live in does not always operate as it should. Sometimes the wise die early. And sometimes the fool lives a long, long time. We live in a broken world. And sometimes things don't happen as they should. Sometimes a nice young man who's taking a, a jog through a neighborhood gets shot. Sometimes a drunk driver kills an entire family. Sometimes your friend gets a terminal diagnosis. Sometimes there's a pandemic that ravages the entire world and 750,000 of your countrymen lose their lives. Seven hundred, three quarters of a million people have lost their lives. No matter if we've tried to listen to reason, tried to listen to wisdom so that she will protect us and guard us, sometimes life just isn't fair. Sometimes things are stolen from us. Sometimes things are taken from us. And so within the wisdom literature of Scripture, we have the book of Proverbs, but we also have a book that we don't like to read a whole lot. But it offers a juxtaposition to this book of Proverbs, things that are generally true. Ecclesiastes says, this is what happens when things are not true. And so Ecclesiastes is not really going to pep you up. It's not going to make you feel like you've watched a Hallmark movie. <laughs> but it may give you some comfort in knowing that sometimes this is the way that life works. It, it may give you a little bit of understanding to know that you are not the only <coughs> one who's had the misfortune of grief in your life. Grief is the elephant in the room of life, and we don't like talking about it. But the, the book of Ecclesiastes makes us confront grief, makes us confront loss, makes us confront the injustices of the world, the pain of the world. And Ecclesiastes says, you know what? Even if you go to church, try to live a good life, try to be a good mom, dad, son, daughter, Sometimes you'll find that you are not immune from grief. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, that's just what I wanted to hear. I should have stayed in bed and watched that Hallmark movie. At least within an hour and a half, everything would have been rosy and peachy and everything would have been good. And I'm afraid that's what we've made church services sometimes. But the truth of the matter is, and what is real to life, is that a lot of times things don't work out the way that they should or the way that we intend. Sometimes people take stuff from us. Sometimes people assassinate our character. Sometimes someone that we loved and poured our life into passes away for no good reason. So the author of... Uh, 
Ecclesiastes. I almost imagine it like one of our grandfathers who smoked a pipe, just sat there and tried to impart some wisdom to young people while he was smoking his pipe. And, and this particular author, the teacher of Ecclesiastes, has the wealth of Jeff Bezos. Everything that money could buy is at his disposal. He has the, the intellect, the, the knowledge of uh, Ken Jennings, the one who won at Jeopardy. And the fame of Michael Jordan, the great basketball athlete. But, but there's still this gnawing feeling within inside of the author of Ecclesiastes that there's more to life than wealth and knowledge and fame. If anyone should be happy, it should be this guy. He's got all the money in the world, all the fame in the world, all the, the knowledge in the world. But he's not content. In fact, he starts off, his book, you know it's going to be a page turner when the second verse in Ecclesiastes says this, and it's not on the screens, but this is, this is what the author says, second verse of the first chapter, perfectly pointless, says the teacher, perfectly pointless, everything is pointless. That word pointless is is translated in some translations, vanity, vanity of vanities. Other translations say meaningless. The CB says pointless. But there's an image that he's getting at that, that life, when we want it to go right, we want things to go forward, we want things to be well, we want to love. Sometimes it seems like Keeping that flame alive is pointless. It's meaningless. It's smoke. It's vapor. And we experience grief. And sometimes the fool lives a long time and the wise perishes young. Sometimes we work and are dedicated our entire lives and, and try to amass wealth and try to have influence only to leave it to our kids who are spoiled brats. And they waste it. They squander it. And so the author's like, what is the point? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? The author goes on 40 times to say this same theme. It's meaningless. It's pointless. It, it's like a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. In chapter 3, our text this morning says there's a season, there's a time for everything. A time for every matter under the heavens. A time for giving birth and a time for dying. A time for planting and a time for uprooting what was planted. A time for killing and a time for healing. A time for tearing down and a time for building up. A time for crying and a time for laughing. A time for mourning and a time for dancing, a time for throwing stones, and a time for gathering stones, a time for embracing, and a time for avoiding embraces, a time for searching, and a time for losing, a time for keeping, and a time for throwing away, a time for tearing, and a time for repairing, a time for keeping silent, and a time for speaking, a time for loving and a time for hating, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The author of Ecclesiastes is yelling at us, do you know what time it is? Do you have built in to your own understanding of who God is and how the world operates do you have built into that margin for grief? Do you have margin for lamenting injustices that happen around you? Do you have margin built into your life to be able to cry out to God that even when somebody tries to do good and follow after God, that sometimes terrible things, tragic things happen in their lives? Or have we painted a rosy picture that if you follow God, everything will go well for you? 
just because uh, grief happens to us all, it doesn't mean that it's easier when it happens to us individually, does it? When you have a front row seat to the casket, when you and I experience job loss, when we have an unexpected transition, when someone takes something from you personally or breaks something that you had, when, when a relationship that you had sours, when people malign your character, one of the only things that is guaranteed in this life outside of death and taxes is that all of us will experience pain. It's guaranteed. It's part of being human. And we shouldn't sugarcoat that in the church. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, says, There is no coming to life without pain. There's no coming to life without pain. C.S. Lewis, the great British theologian, said, Cancer and cancer and cancer. My mother, my father, and my wife. I wonder who is next in the queue. We need permission to grieve. You know, it's October of 2021, but a lot of times I'll wake up in the morning and still feel like it's 2020 sometimes. Feels like we've been in this perpetual cycle of, of being afraid that we or our friends and loved ones are going to get ill with this sickness and not be able to, to continue. 750,000 lives have been lost. This has been the most contentious political year that I've ever seen in the last at least 40 or 50 years in America. Do we have time built into our lives to grieve? To lament the way that things are not as they should be. And death itself is an injustice. The writer of Ecclesiastes also says that God has written eternity on each human heart. And the reason why death stings so much when we lose a loved one it is because God has written eternity on our hearts. But oftentimes we, we feel ashamed for grieving. We feel like we should be over it by now. If we've lost someone or something didn't turn out the way, we, we, we think that we should have moved on by now. In fact, even our closest friends and family might insensitively tell us to move on or to get over it. Oftentimes, we are not given the time, the space to adequately grieve, to lament. There's a lady that I watched who gave a TED Talk on her experience of, of losing so much tragically within a short period of time. And, and she shared from her experience... Um, she shared that pain and that, that feeling of everyone wanting her to move on. And she said she remembers that, that there were children who were born during this time, but they celebrated their first birthday, second birthday, third birthday, and they expected friends and family to come out for all those birthdays for their kids. So on joyful occasions, we always celebrate. On tragic, painful occasions, we pe tell people to get over it, move on. It's not that easy, is it? It's not that easy when you had something that shaped your life that was painful. Whether you talk about it or not, it, you, you carry that with you. You remember the date of that event. And so on All Saints Day, we get to remember those whom we've lost, those whose lives seem so incredibly short, even if they live 90, 100 years. Because God has written eternity on our hearts. And so we come as a way to respect and give honor and thank God for the life that they lived. And we grieve that they are no longer physically present with us. So I'm going to invite us to recite the liturgy that we customarily do on uh, All Saints Day. It will be on the screens and then we're going to ring a bell and light a candle.
uh, for each person whose life has been lost in connection with this church this year. And we have a 12th candle for people that you want to remember and pray for in, in your seat during this time. So I, I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the screens and recite this liturgy with me. We remember the great ancestors of our faith, from Abraham and Sarah to Paul and Phoebe. Ancestors of the faith. We remember you. We remember the prophets and the priests, the ministers and teachers who have taught us the way of God. Teachers of the faith, we remember you. We remember our grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles, those who have gone before us in our lifetime. Family of our faith, we remember you. We lift up the memories of children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, and parents whose lives ended too soon. We lift up to you, O oh God, the names of those we have lost in this past year from our lives, knowing that they are with your heart forever. As we read these names, we will pause after every name to remember, to pray, and to give thanks for their life. If you look in your bulletins, you'll see a list of the names of folks that we loved and cared for and who loved and cared for us, who we've lost this year. Pam, Pam Berberick. Angela Black. Clarence Earnhardt. Betty Hunsucker. Bob Keller, Mildred Keller, Joanne Michael, David Mosley, Francis Owen, Curtis Thompson, Janie Wagner, and also the person that you've been thinking about this entire service, if you will remember their name and as we prepare for communion, if you would like to come up and pray during this final song you are you're more than welcome to pray at this altar. Gracious God, we remember those whom we have lost. God, we ask that even during this time, we, we have intentionally set apart this time to collectively grieve and lament, to share our pain, to, to let others know and... and, and their um, journey through pain and grief, that they are not alone, that it is um, a part of our human condition. And we ask that you would meet us here in a special way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. During this time, uh, we're going to... Um, Participate in the liturgy of the great thanksgiving. So I'm going to ask Reverend Donnie to start that for us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God, God of power and might, 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, his Father. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. This morning we're going to do something a little unusual. Uh, unusual to those of us who've become accustomed to being able to come to this table, to being able to, to come and communi- commune with God and fellowship with God any time that we would like. We understand that for people who've gone through an intense time of grief or mourning, sometimes they feel like they could pray, but no one is listening. They could feel distant from God. And so in remembrance of that, we want to reserve this for the week before Thanksgiving and understand that there are times in our life where we feel, because of circumstances or situations, we feel distant from God. And so um, we're going to not come to the table, but remember how precious and joyful it is to be able to come. So, Danny, Daniel, will you please uh, lead us in this final song? And if you guys would stand. the 
may you leave this place with hearts filled with hope and peace and eyes open for a world that's in pain. Amen. Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are Jesus Christ, oh, come 
bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the 